Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with John Mackey. He's the uh, co-founder and co-CEO of Whole Foods Market. John, thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me on, Nick. This is a point in time where we have a, a presidential election between the two most disliked and statist uh, politicians in, in a generation, at least. The economy is slow, but is also kind of inventive. You are a very high-profile libertarian. Is this a good time to be a libertarian or a bad time to be a libertarian? It's a bad time to be a libertarian in the sense that uh, the left appears to be increasingly trying to police correct thinking, correct speech, and they, they, they tend to uh, they go after those who do not, you know, whether it be on climate change or on gay marriage, it's a real chilling effect for any kind of freedom of speech. And in that sense, it's a bad time. It's a good time in the sense that who knows what's going to happen to the Republican Party? They could suffer a meltdown in this election, and and if that happens, then possible change within that party might be possible. Serious change for the first time in a long, long time. That could be a libertarian opportunity. You were a uh, supporter of Rand Paul in the election, uh, or in the Republican primary system. What do you think went wrong with his candidacy? I think it's several factors came into play. One is he was not seen, unlike his father, who was seen as an outsider. Uh, I don't think Rand was seen as an outsider any longer. He was a senator. Uh, he didn't. He thought he would get his father's uh, support, and uh, he didn't get it. I th so I think that was the biggest factor. And then you had this uh, at a time when terrorism is increasing. The the message that we need to be less aggressive militarily doesn't. It's not playing that well. In, in mainstream America who's scared. So that message did not land well. The security message was a problem. And then I don't think his economic message was, uh, which I agreed with, but I just don't think people are that as, as interested in that right now. So I think his timing might have been bad. And then you have the whole populist thing with the nativism movement uh, that Trump has, has capitalized on so much. I think he was the outsider candidate. and and. Rand Paul was the insider and just one of many insiders and was rejected by the, by the electorate. What is your thought on Trump? Are you, is, he, uh, you know, is he plausible in any way for you as a uh, candidate or as a, as a president? Uh, no, he's not. You're a successful businessman. He is a successful businessman. What do you sense as his uh, kind of philosophy of business or of commerce or of economics and how does it differ from yours? You know, I would say, first of all, he seems to me to be almost a prototypical crony capitalist, meaning he's made donations to both sides of the political party. Oftentimes in real estate, you need to get certain approvals through various government agencies, and you've got to, be, you've got to play both sides of the fence to get deals done. He's a, I think uh, uh, Trump sees himself primarily as a great deal maker, and he wrote a book on it, The Art of the Deal. So, he sees politics through that spectrum, or through that lens. And for him, I think, uh, he, he doesn't fit the kind of entrepreneurial capitalist that, uh, that I feel like that I, that I represent. Uh, Non-cronyism, creating value for other people. Uh, and one of the interesting things, of course, is that he is seen as a capitalist, he's seen as a, a businessman, and yet, in a lot of ways, he's He's not really that well, a good representative of it. Talk about Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, because this these are the choices, right? One of them almost certainly is going to be the pre next president of the United States. What do you worry about under a Hillary Clinton presidency? I mean, there seems to be a compelling evidence that of uh, the Clintons not being um, they're certainly not straight shooters. Uh, they they seem to uh, Hillary seems to be as much as I complained about Trump being a crony capitalist. I think. Hillary falls into that category herself. I mean, you just look at the money she received from all the speeches she's made, and it's it's like a who's who of, of the financial sector, health care, and defense contractors. It's astounding. And then you see the Clinton Initiative with a lot of money pouring in from foreign governments. Uh, it's it's disturbing. I mean, that doesn't. It's a smoking gun. It doesn't necessarily mean that any bullets were fired, but it is concerning to me, to be, to say the least. Plus, we have the record of, of the Clinton administration in, in, the, in the past, and 
You had all those pardons granted at the end. It, it, it's, it's, it's disturbing. I worry about it. But there is a third term out there, at least, or a third possibility, which is uh, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld running as the Libertarian Party ticket. What do you think of them? I don't know Weld. Uh, I know Gary, and uh, yeah, I like Gary. Is he the perfect Libertarian candidate? No, but um, his overall, I probably agree with him on about 90% of the stuff, and that's far higher than I agree with Hillary or, or, or Trump. So um, the interesting thing there is they're polling pretty high, but when people get in there to vote, I mean, I'm going to vote for Gary Johnson, So, but when they get in there to, to vote, because the old argument, you're just throwing your vote away, is such a powerful argument that they're, they're probably, he's probably going to get fewer votes than he's polling right. at the end of the day. But still, I mean, if the, if the Libertarians were to get 2 or 3%, that would be an outstanding election cycle for them because and they've never gotten that much before. They're running in the, that kind of fat middle of, the, of where the country really is, that people are generally socially tolerant and fiscally responsible. They want a you know, government that is less in your business and, you know, and, and, and can pay its own bills. Do you think that that kind of thinking is actually ascendant? I mean, clearly the Republican and Democratic parties don't give outlets to that kind of thinking, but are, is America moving in that kind of soft I thought so direction? when I read, read you and Matt's book no. a few years ago, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't seem to be playing out that way. I mean, the, the, the nativism that I had no idea until Trump ascended how powerful the nativism sentiments are, because I think that's the key to understand Trump. It's nativistic in immigration, nativistic in, in jobs, in foreign policy, in taxes, in every, in every way. It seems a very strong nativistic uh, yeah, one philosophy. Of the, one of the interesting things, uh, and it hasn't really come, out to pl or come into play yet, but polls routinely show that even 50% or more of Republicans believe in not just in, in current levels of immigration, but a pathway to citizenship or legality for currently illegals. And, the, and Democrats, it's a little bit higher. So it will be interesting to see if nativism, it clearly carried Trump through the primary and then what happens in a general election. Your business in many ways is built on kind of free trade agreements. The fact that you can bring in goods from all over the world and put them into one place. Why does it you know, that a lot of people are okay with on the right, but then when you talk about bringing it, letting people from all over the world move here, what is, the, what is the switch that is flipped that makes that a totally different and much more terrifying scenario? If, if you study the history of the United States, and I've studied it very carefully for a long time, always when we're doing immigration, there's, whenever there's been accelerated immigration in American history, there have been race riots, and, and whether it be the Irish coming in, or Italians, or uh, there's always been pushback against it. Uh, so it's like our nation can handle a certain amount of immigration, but when it gets to be too much, too fast, then the culture is unable to absorb it effectively, Americanize it, so to speak, and people become scared and threatened by it. And I think we're in one of those situations right now. Plus, I think there is an element of probably an element of racism in it in the sense that uh, uh, fear of, of non-whites and uh, uh, it's, it's, there's, I think there's an element of that in it. From a, your business perspective, what are the biggest things holding back economic growth? You know, one of the things over about the past 10 or 15 years, average, or economic growth has averaged around 2% or less a year. The historic average since World War II is about 3%. So that's a, a big variance. It's a couple of obvious things. Most importantly is regulations. I feel like there's almost a regulatory war against corporations in America right now. It's, it's the number of regulators attacking Whole Foods is, is unprecedented in our entire history. And uh, honestly, I, I don't feel like it's risky for me to even talk about it because I don't want additional regulatory uh, harassment that cost our company tens of millions of dollars. And What's I feel like that's happening. I talked to other CEOs and this is not just a Whole Foods problem. They're all feeling the squeeze on, the, on a regulate, regulatory agencies what is harassing a, them. What's an example of a, of a useless regulation that you've, you deal with that you know, makes it harder to, to deliver you know, services and goods at, at a good price? We're dealing with a, a toxic waste issue, disposal of uh, multiple vitamins that have selenium in them. They have a little few micrograms, and that's been classified by the EPA as a toxic waste. 
What so is selenium? Selenium is a, is a trace mineral that we need nutritionally, but only in very small little amounts. So when we're, when we get, what do we do when multiple vitamins are returned to us? For some reason, they're dissatisfied, we take it back. Well, because it has selenium in it, we can't just throw that in the landfill, of which, of course, we did. We just threw it in the trash. That now has to be disposed of as a toxic waste. Well, I mean, that sets up a whole toxic waste disposal system for vitamins that people are eating, okay? <laughs> I would say that yeah. seems like kind of a nonsensical regulation. But there's all types of employment regulations. Very di it's increasingly difficult in the United States to be able to terminate anyone, particularly anyone that's in a protected class. The amount of... Um, paperwork that you have to track, and even then, you're probably still going to get sued, and very likely you'll either lose or you'll have to settle. Uh, to play devil's advocate, people would be like, well, it's good. You shouldn't be able to fire people quickly, especially people in protected classes, because they're in protected classes because they need protection. I disagree. I mean, employment is a voluntary exchange that occurs between individuals who are looking for work and employers who are looking to hire. I mean, should people be able to quit whenever they want to, or, 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 or should we be able to force them to continue to work for us? I mean, I, I firmly believe that it's not in the best interest of any employer to fire people arbitrarily, and this is what's usually held up, abuse. And does that occasionally occur? Of course it does. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to set up the system so that employers are constantly uh, uh, being incented or harassed if they do terminate someone. Because, if, again, why would they want to terminate a good worker? They wouldn't. And, uh, but yet they're constantly seen as guilty of doing something wrong, and then they have to prove their innocence when they terminate someone. But that doesn't go on the other side of the equation. If somebody terminates or, or, or resigns because they found a better job or, or they don't like it or they're racist and they don't like the company, who knows? Yeah. But there's no, so it's to me a double standard. Talk about uh, the 365 stores that you're starting to roll out. How are those uh, different than a traditional Whole Foods market and uh, what are you hoping to, uh, to accomplish with that? The stores are smaller than a tr traditional Whole Foods market. Uh, they have only about a quarter of the, of the number of products that you might have in a Whole Foods. It's a very curated product mix. And then we've, we're building these stores for about a third of the cost of a regular Whole Foods market. So the capital cost is significantly lower. And then we've restructured this, the stores to have far lower labor component. The long and the short of it is, is that we've taken about a, what we call basis points, a thousand basis points or 10 whole percentage points out of the cost structure. And that's been passed on to the customers in much lower prices. So we have very low produce prices and uh, very low center store prices, and we, yet we have Whole Foods markets kind of prepared foods mm -hmm. selection, and our quality standards are still in effect. So we think this is a, a very successful format that we're probably going to have hundreds of these stores in the, within not that many years. And will they compete against Whole Foods market, or do they supplement it, or how does that work? There will be some competition, of course. There'll be some overlap in customers. But what we found so far is the cannibalization has been less than we anticipated, that we're getting a customer in that's more price sensitive, that we were not getting into Whole Foods market stores. Uh, and so the number of Trader Joe's bags that we've seen shopping yeah, in our yeah. stores is unprecedented. Is that kind of the direct competitor for the Trader Joe's is a direct, I mean, yeah. in some ways, 365 competes with Trader Joe's, it competes with Sprouts farmer's markets. But of course, the main competitors are the, are the mainstream supermarkets like Kroger and HEB and Wegmans. But we now have a, a model, a business model, that allows us to be less expensive and not be under undersold by anyone. And that's a, that's a good place to be in. Speaking of cannibalization, let's talk about the movie that you've helped uh, produce, At the Fork, uh, which is done by the uh, uh, Lisa and uh, John Popola, the great documentary filmmakers. Um, and it is about uh, John's kind of uh, move towards veganism or understanding of animal welfare in the food production change. Well, of course, John has not become a vegan. Yeah. So it's John Popola and Lisa Versace are a married couple, and they are um, uh, Lisa's a vegetarian, John is a, is a, a carnivore, and the film starts out with a, a Popola. Uh, family gathering where they're 
they're eating uh, what is ribs. It? It's called the, is it the Rib Fest? The or Rib meat Fest. fest? Yeah. Rib Fest. Yeah. And uh, that shows that. Mm-hmm. And, and then Lisa expresses her disapproval of that. And they begin this journey into America, basically, mm-hmm. to see how our animal foods are raised. Mm-hmm. And what's fascinating about the film is the film itself is very non judgmental and it lets the camera do the talking mm-hmm. and it lets every, so it, it goes from some of the factory farm producers all the way up to some smaller animal uh, ranchers who are treating their animals surprisingly mm-hmm. very, very well. High, right. So they're all different grades of welfare treatment mm-hmm. and each, in a sense, allows each of the animal farmers or ranchers to give their own philosophy. Yeah, I mean, it's actually really, I found it fascinating because it's it's a movie, it is about a journey, and there aren't villains here, or, or the, the farmers, the, the factory farmers aren't treated as poor, stupid people who only care about a buck, um, but they do have constraints, and they voice time and time again, like, I will I will treat my livestock any way that my customer has asked me to. It, it is fascinating, yeah. because uh, their philosophies get articulated, and so the film is remarkably fair. It's unlike some films that might come in with a a, the, a real biased point of view, and then set it. Say, if Michael Moore was producing right. a documentary, he would, he would come in with a bias, and then make sure the film comes out that way. This was a discovery process, and uh, and they let these far, they're fair to the, all the farmers. They all they all get a chance to give their philosophical perspective. Are there, are there farmers, because I was taken by the, you know, at various stages as they get closer to a more kind of uh, animal friendly, generally a higher end price point and stuff like that, but all of the producers pretty much say some variation of, I don't really have a stake in how I raise my, I, like what I'm doing is to serve the customer and if the customer wants something at a certain price, I'm going to do it in a more industrial way or a less industrial way. Are there people who are ideologically committed to kind of factory farm pro, uh, processes or, or you know, treating livestock in the least um, thoughtful way? I don't know if ideology is what I would say. The overwhelming driving thing that has always been in food production is how can we get cost down? Just like Whole Foods Market with 365 is thinking through our business model, how can we take cost out so we can get lower prices to our customers? That same logic carries for that's the way capitalism works and here you have uh, uh, the, as one of the uh, as James McWilliams says a uh, 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 professor of history says these decisions that moved us towards the factory farm system were hundreds if not thousands of small little innovations that took us in this direction of taking cost out of the system and ultimately the lowest cost system is one that has scale and which uh, minimizes feed co- inputs and uh, all the other factors of production. And that tends to be, by most p- d- dispassionate viewers, is pretty inhumane, pretty you cruel are to the a, animals. You are a vegan yourself? Correct. Um, can you uh, briefly recount your conversion? A little over 13 years ago, I was at an annual Whole Foods Market annual meeting for our stockholders in Santa Monica, California. We were being picketed by animal rights activists uh, and they were disrupting our meeting. I was very happy about that. I thought like they don't, they shouldn't even be here. This is inappropriate. But I got into discussion with the activists after the meeting was over, particularly this one very tiny but passionate young woman named uh, Lauren Ornelius and we began an email exchange and we were going back and forth because for my attitude back then was, I don't know why they're picking on us. We're we're doing more for animals than anybody else. Why aren't they going after Safeway or Kroger, for example? And because as they would say, well, we thought you would actually listen. (laughs) We didn't think they would. And I remember her telling me, she said, John, I can see that you're actually very idealistic man, you're not like I thought you would be. I didn't think you're not like a typical corporate CEO. But when it comes to animal welfare and animal, the way animal livestock animals are treated in the United States, you are remarkably ignorant. And Was she right about that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be because you're running a fairly large corporation and you sort of owe it to all of your customers and employees to know better about these things. So I was taken aback and I realized, you know, she's probably right about that. I could be better informed. So that summer, summer of 2003, I read about a dozen books on livestock animals in America, how it evolved, 
practices. And God, about midway through, after I read four or five books, I thought, God, you know, she's really right. I don't know. I didn't know anything. And furthermore, uh, we got to change. Got to do something about it. By the time the summer was over, I had said, I, I'm not going to eat animals anymore. I, I became a vegan, and I, and from an ethical standpoint. And then I also decided, you know, Whole Foods needs to do a lot more here. So we invited the activists to work with us as, as on our team, so to speak, and then bring in animal scientists, bring in uh, the farmers themselves, bring them together into meetings, and let's talk about how we can develop more hired animal welfare uh, systems that have higher... And th so that's how I converted, and that's what, what Whole Foods has been doing ever since. Is there a point where the... Uh you know, where you will, from a kind of moral perspective, stop selling animal products? Or, like, how do, you, how do you square that between you're treating the animals better, but you're still selling them? Is that because the customer wants them? Or where, wh when does that end? You know, it's funny. I get asked that question a lot. And I suppose because I'm so closely identified with the Whole Foods Market brand and people, for the most part, don't understand how yeah. corporations work, they think, quite incorrectly, that Whole Foods Market's like my company. Mm -hmm that I'm like this all-powerful owner that can do whatever I want. And, but in fact, I founded the company, but we're a very large corporation at this point. And uh, uh, it, it, I, I always tell the story that, let's say I wanted to do that. I, I would not be able to do it. If I said, you know what, guys? I really think we need to stop selling meat. That's just the right thing to do. And so effective this date, I'm issuing a command as the as a co-founder, co-CEO, that we're going to phase out of meat. Well, everybody would think it was a joke. They would not They would laugh, and, and I'd say, no, 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 no. I'm very serious about this. We, I've seen the light. We are going to stop selling meat at Whole Foods Market. And they would say, John, you've got to be kidding. You know, we can't do that. It would completely ruin the business. And I said, nevertheless, it's the right thing to do. By God, we're going to do it. About that time, uh, of course, the rest of the executive team would be like, what has happened to John? He's like going crazy. But then if I persisted, calls would go to the board of directors. They'd say, we got to do something. He's about to wreck our business. Uh, and I would get calls from the board, and they would say, John, you know, you, you, this, you can't do this. You're going to have to back off on this. And I'd say, no, this is the right thing to do. By God, I'm going to do it. Well, if I continued to persist, I would be removed as a CEO. That's just the reality of the situation. That's the way business sort of works. And that's the right thing for them to do because Whole Foods Market ultimately, ultimately has to serve its customers. And I'd like nothing better than the customers to vote with their dollars for Whole Foods Market to stop selling animal foods. And but until that vote occurs, we're going to continue to sell them because that's what they want to buy. And that's part of the function uh, of At the Fork, right? That I mean, you're, it's not a preachy movie. I mean, it is didactic. There's a message there, but it's uh, hopefully raising people's consciousness. I really think At the Fork's... Yeah. If it has a purpose, it's to raise people's consciousness because the average American has no idea how animals are raised. They don't want to know. There's sort of massive cultural denial about it. I actually think that 100 years from now, we'll look back on the factory farm era with the same kind of ethical revulsion that we look back on, say, slavery, which was obviously completely uh, morally reprehensible by any standard. Uh, and I think this will be seen in a similar light. Although, I, and I say that, sometimes people are offended because they don't, they see the, the moral revulsion of slavery, but they have not yet opened their eyes to see the moral reversion of what we're doing to factory farm animals. So this film is an attempt to, not, it's PG-13. We're not showing the most horrible stuff because otherwise people just walk out of the theater. We're giving it in a measured dose, and most importantly, we're showing them that there are better alternatives. So if, if I had my way, when people finish watching that film, they'd, they'd be faced with an ethical dilemma, which is, I'm going to either, I'm not going to eat meat anymore, or I'm only going to eat higher animal welfare meat. Uh, that would be the choice I'd like to see people make. Well, the movie is At the Fork, uh, and we have been talking to Whole Foods co-founder and co-CEO John Mackey. Thanks so much for talking to us, John. Thanks, Nick. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.